great. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious that we've all been sitting for about an hour and a half. So as sitting is the new smoking, could I encourage everybody maybe just to stand up? We are at a health conference. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, like jiggle wiggle, move your arms. I don't know about you, but I've got a really bad crick in my neck. And listening to all these stories about, you know, genetic testing, how we can improve screening, women's health, I feel like I've now got 98 things wrong with me um, that I probably didn't have when I walked in here this morning. So I hope everybody feels a little bit jiggle wiggle. We've only got 20 more minutes before coffee. Um, and yeah, you know, like sit down whenever you feel comfortable. You know, stand, sit. Um, <laughs> so as Greg has very kindly said, my name's Indra. I'm a doctor by background in emergency medicine and I joined Palantir Technologies about a year ago. For those of you who aren't aware of what we do, some of you may have heard about the COVID vaccination program. We're a software company. The vaccination program was built on our software. And what I want to do today is just give you a brief overview of some of the work that we've done to really accelerate research into, um, into long COVID. So um, this is not just a story about software and data. And we've heard a lot about data and data can be quite cool. I personally find data really, really exciting. I've heard all of the speakers today talk about data and, um, and that really, you know, I'm going, like, wow, this is so exciting. Let's talk more about data. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the boring aspects of data. I don't have a whizzy, cool technology to show you, but I do want to show you about how when you get the fundamentals right, you can really accelerate both research, but also, also findings um, that many of us have, have come across. So. So let's just talk a little bit about long COVID. Um, some of us, many of us in this room may have had a COVID test. We may have had symptoms of COVID, may have been diagnosed with it, but unfortunately a number of us still are suffering from those symptoms of long COVID. So this year in January, ONS reported a survey and approximately 2 million people are still experiencing symptoms of um, long COVID. And normally the infection, as we all know, if we've had it, you usually recover after a few weeks but some of us continue to have it. And across all age groups, so this includes children, you see around 10 to 20% of people are still suffering from those symptoms. And the diagram on the, on the right here shows that, you know, there's a huge range of symptoms that are really there. And when you have something that's novel and unknown, how do you start understanding what is that disease? How do we better research it? How do we better understand not just how to diagnose it, but how to better manage it? And actually, this is a real problem, not just here in the UK, but across Europe and globally. Earlier this, um, earlier this year, The Lancet, they did a review um, on the number of people who, are look, who have uh, been diagnosed with long COVID, and around 65 million globally, and that's just an estimate because it's so hard to diagnose, are still struggling with the effects of long COVID. And what does that mean? That actually means, you know, you have this huge conglomerate of symptoms that you're suffering with, but then that affects your mental health, it affects your well-being, it has an impact on the economy. And earlier this year, the WHO in Europe said, you know, we've really got to try and focus a bit more on this. We've got to encourage policymakers, governments to actually focus and put some more effort and money into understanding these effects. So, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is just reversing a few years in time, back to sort of pre-pandemic time. And for those of you who aren't aware, in the US, the National Institutes of Health, they have a program called NCATS, which, let me get the acronym right, is the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. And um, so they, they wanted to set what you call a collaborative analytics environment. And the diagrams illustrated up there and what this was, was very much to improve research across many different areas, but also, as I said, ensure collaborative analytics. So what do we mean by collaborative analytics? Well, quite often in research, it's quite a competitive environment. We've heard from some academics, we've seen lots of studies being talked about, and so often it's about the first author or the person who's led that research program. But actually, there's often a huge number of people involved in that those who go all the way from data collection to cleansing, harmonizing that data, to producing clinical trials, all the way to publication. And so by bringing together all those different diverse sets of groups, 
you start creating what we call collaborative analytics. And so there was a grant. The team won this grant to set up this um, collaborative analytics environment. But they really struggled in trying to get those data sources together. And even though they struggled, um, they managed to do it. They did it on um, our Foundry platform. And then this is really just to talk a little bit about uh, the, the challenges of actually, when you've got something, how do you understand what is, what is good for discovery? So we've quite often, you know, we've had a lot of speakers here today talk about different conditions. We've had a great speaker talk about um, and, uh, genetic testing as well and kind of looking at screening. So when you want to do things like this, you actually need a huge amount of information to look at patterns and understand what is happening in those areas. And so this is just a very kind of brief overview of the benefits of both what we call a federated and centralized approach. And when you're trying to do centralized um, uh, discovery, the centralized approach is far better. So when you're challenged with a condition that you know very little about, so we go back to long COVID, um, you know, you need to understand how to bring that data in. And what this slide is trying to show you is actually data quality, which isn't something we speak often about. We quite often talk about data, and then we talk about the end result of what that data has done. But actually, for those of us in the room who've had to manipulate or harmonize data, you know what the challenges are. So for some of us, so for example, if I say I've ordered a head CT, is that the same as saying, I've ordered a brain CT? Are they the same thing? When you're coding, actually, that's vitally important. And then when you're trying to do discoveries, actually having a common language, a common methodology is also very important. So this centralized analytics approach allows you to harmonize that data quality and not only understand where, where the differences are, but also create what we call a feedback mechanism. So you start helping people who are capturing that information, capture it in the same way and therefore you can understand more about these different conditions. And so this slide just shows like, the different effects um, that we've had on those, those data qualities. And really this is saying, how do we then, um, so what, what, why do we care about data harmonization? Um, <laughs> I've been banging on a little bit about data quality, but why care about it? Because when you're looking at something that you don't understand or you don't have much information on already, so for example, the COVID um, condition, understanding that you can compare like for like is vitally important. So being able to compare apples with apples, being able to understand, okay, you're using oxygen at this particular level, and I'm comparing that all the way across the country on another hospital and another patient in the same setting. And so being able to compare information across many different settings is really important. And so this is why we quite often want to make sure that we can have data harmonization and ensure that those people looking at the information on it can do um, really cool stuff. And how is this also important? So quite often we talk about building models, building um, algorithms. When you've got a platform that allows you to understand the end-to-end -end of that data journey, when you build your models, when you build your algorithms and you make tweaks on them, you can understand and it can be fed back to where that data came from. So this is why we like to quite often focus a little bit more on data harmonization and ensuring harmonization. So the data, the N3 data enclave was, came out the, um, the start of the pandemic. So whilst NCATS was very keen to look at various different um, pathology areas and encourage that collaborative analytics, at the beginning of the pandemic, they actually had to focus down and say, okay, we need to start looking at this particular condition. Um, and the previous speaker spoke about the US, you know, it's a, 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 a private payer system very disjointed, lots of different hospitals all working in silos. And actually, if you're a government or you're a system, how do you really start impacting policy decision and understanding what's best for the nation when you've got all these different pockets? And so the NCAT set up this N3 National COVID Cohort Collaborative, which is still going today. You can see the impact it's made. Um, and, you know, around seven, seven million cases so if you're diagnosed with COVID, you've got a COVID diagnosis proven through a laboratory test. Your information is then transmitted into this data enclave. 
And what it has allowed is researchers to start asking questions on that information. And by harmonizing all that information, it's really encouraged people to understand what are these symptoms of long COVID? You know, we've talked about it a little bit in the literature, but we're not sure because we're still tracking these patients through time. What treatments are actually affecting these people when we're giving it to them? What are the outcomes of those treatments and how are we tracking those over time? And actually by collating that information, by allowing lots of different um, research groups to work on that information, you then enable much more research to be done and much more to be um, published and learned. And so the M3 represents one of the largest secure collections of harmonized clinical health data in the US. And the power of this is not just about that information and the depth of that information, but it's about the diversity of teams working together. So one of the speakers earlier spoke today around every user in the healthcare system has lots of different needs from patients to policymakers to people who design apps and digital health tools, all the way to those who evaluate it. And when you start bringing those different diverse teams together, what you end up happening is far more valuable outputs being delivered. And here's just a snapshot of some of the research that's been published on the back of this N3 data enclave. Um, some of this is in preprint, some of this is still coming out. But really what I want to draw attention to is that, yes, there's been a huge amount of studies, lots of publications. We've now learned a lot more about the SARS um, virus than we had before but also about bringing those diff different teams together. And so often we like to talk about, you know, the first author or the person who's been in charge of the research. And that's cool, that's sexy, you know, you're, you're the person who's published the information. But actually there's a huge amount of work that goes underneath, and we call those attributions. And what this platform's really allowed is anybody who's attributed to that data to be recognized, to be seen and to be heard and to be brought into the limelight as well. And so Dr. Melissa Handel, who oversees this program, was telling me the other day, actually they published one paper and they had over 300 contributors. And it took the journal a good eight months to go through all of those contributors. Now this is something that's really different that doesn't normally happen in research. You know, Normally you have a small team who are involved. And so that's what I'd just really like to highlight, that this isn't just about the data, about bringing it together, but also about transforming the way we do research, about making it far more collaborative, but also highlighting that you know, it can be for anyone. Um, we talked about at the beginning, I talked about the, the different um, symptoms of COVID. And actually here is one of the uh, studies that was published a couple of years ago around looking at how on the back of the information from the N3 platform, how do you actually recognize long COVID in children? Um, and then this one is about how do you inform policy? So what about those treatments? How do you know where to send vaccinations? Um, and this I just want to end on is really about it's so easy to talk about technology. People love talking about technology and what it does and all the cool things. But actually transforming culture is really hard. And for those of us in the room who've you know, had to implement policy decisions or had to try and implement technology, that's almost that easy bit. It's transforming the culture and changing the way technology is used in the workplace or in a particular way has really um, can transform the pathway. And so this slide, the N3 team, they won an award. And I wanted to you know, just highlight 106 teams. That's really bringing together a huge amount of diverse groups and also across 26 different countries. So again, you know, this is about bringing people together to be able to work on a common problem and to solve it in a way that hasn't been solved before. And um, just to end, conscious of time, uh, it's, still, it's still coming out, so maybe, uh, I don't know if I'm going to break anything, um, but the team have also got a publication coming out, not a publication, an article coming out in Teen Vogue, which I think is really inspirational. So we've heard lots about women's health and about inspiring the new generation and how about educational understanding. And if we want to get more children and more girls involved in these quite technical subjects, we've got to inspire them. And actually, they've got a great article coming out in Teen Vogue, which just talks about how if you do collaborative analytics in a very diverse way, it can be quite cool and quite exciting. So thank you.